All right, so um, for this, I was just going to do a quick overview of Git and GitHub. How many people are like familiar or use these already? Most people? OK, this is going to be pretty pointless then. But just in case you were confused, uh, I'm just going to do a couple of slides, which is like a con quick conceptual overview. I'll just do a quick demo for people who've never used Git or GitHub and what the difference is. And, uh, and then I'll just, and that's all I'll do. OK. So what is the point of Git and GitHub? What we're trying to do is avoid a situation like this. A lot of people might be familiar with this, right? So on the right is some project folder I have. I might have like made some changes to a file, and then I rename it, and then I rename it again, and I lose track of what's going on. You know, I have no information of what the differences are, who I've worked on it, I, how do I collaborate easily with people. We want to we solve this problem. We want to make things very reproducible. And so what we're going to do is uh, use a system that basically allows us to easily keep track of our work history, collaborate with others, and we want things to be reproducible in case I want to go back in the future or go back into the past or into the future in terms of what the changes to what I've done in my work are. So what we effectively want is some sort of time machine for our files, right? And we want be able to, other people to be able to jump on into this time machine with us, and we want to be able to um, revert back to things we've done in the past or incorporate changes from collaborators and, and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, this is what Git tries to solve. Um, it is complicated. There's a steep learning curve. But I think in my experience, and maybe many people here, you're probably going to just use a handful of commands most of the time. If you want to get deeper into it later on, you know, of course, uh, you should try. But I would say that most of the time, you're going to use a handful of things in your, in your daily workflow. And I'll just sort of describe to you what those are. So conceptually, this, this idea is called version control. And there's a lot of different systems out there. Um, Git is arguably one of the most popular ones, um, most powerful, but also it has a little bit of difficulty here. So conceptually, th this is a sort of what we're trying to do. Let's say that you're working on some sort of file. You know, you do some work. You make some changes. You save it as a new file. You do some work. You save some changes. You make it as a new file. This is our sort of old way of doing things. What Git is trying to accomplish is, is a sort of different conceptualization of this. In the sort of Git and version control framework, you're going to do some work. You're going to take a snapshot. You're going to sort of freeze files, project folders, whatever you want to keep under version control as a sort of timestamp. Then you're going to do some new work, and then you're going to take another snapshot. You're going to do some more work. You're going to take another snapshot. These snapshots are basically ways of maintaining history of things that you've done in the past. And in red, generally, just for these couple of slides, I've sort of outlined what the actual commands are, the syntax for Git. And then I'm sort of using uh, uh, metaphors and analogies, hopefully, that are uh, understandable for what's actually going on in these commands. So like, here's a couple of typical use cases I'll describe. So let's say you want to go back in time. This is pretty straightforward to do. You can use a, a git revert or reset command. This is basically saying, hey, I have a snapshot at some point in the past. I've done some changes. I can easily go back. So that's one pretty typical use case for something like git, rolling things back. Another one that's pretty common is collaborating with, uh, with people. So let's say that you're working on something. You've taken your first snapshot. Now you've done another analysis. You've taken a, another snapshot. Let's say someone in your lab decides they want to contribute to this project as well. All they need to do is make their own copy of this. And this is called forking in Git lingo. Um, they can take their own snapshot. And now they're sort of operating in this separate timeline from you. So they can work on it. And then they can say, hey, check out these changes I've made. This is called a pull request in Git lingo. And then you can incorporate these back into the final file. And now the end result is something that's a contribution based on what you've done and what another person has done. Right? It makes things like this really easy to collaborate. Plus, this entire timeline is preserved. So if at any point in time you want to jump back to some version because something's not working, really straightforward to be able to do that. Uh, another use case is something like parallel development. So let's say you're working in a package or something like that. You make a, a new tool. People can use it. A lot of uh, um, our lab does this all the time. A lot of the other labs in the, in the uh, tools we're providing you for the workshop um, have been doing this. So let's say there's some official release. Everyone's using it. The world is great. While that's happening, you decide, hey, wouldn't it be neat if I can add some new feature to this? Now, I don't want to break things that people are already relying on maybe at other sites or if you're building some sort of production application. But I'd like to continue developing this project further. So what you can do is you can create a new branch. And effectively, what this is is a new timeline for your work. right? So you have your independent timeline that other people are using every single day. But you can create this alternate timeline that you can tinker with and add new features, fix bugs, so on and so forth. And the same sort of general principles apply. You'll do some work. You'll take a snapshot of that. You'll do some more work. You'll take another snapshot of that. And this entire process can go on for as long as you like a month, a year, however long you need to. And the entire time that official release people have been working on for the past is still there, untouched, unbroken. No one has to worry about anything. 
And at some point in the future, you can integrate those changes, make another release, and then everyone gets to use the cool new feature that you've added into your, into your program. Um, so in general, Git is basically, I think this analogy of a flexible timeline uh, might be one to help people understand it if, if they found certain concepts confusing. Git itself is a command line application. It's a program. There are GUI applications out there too. So in case you want a visual representation for what's going on, um, there are tools that make that really easy to do. I have some links in the slide to those. Um, and in general, I would think about it as a way to basically go sideways or forwards or backwards in time without having you to create files and name them in particular ways and lose track of what's going on. Um, GitHub, on the other hand, is something that integrates almost perfectly with Git. It's basically a cloud storage site. You can think of it in that way. It's a way that you can take your entire timeline, put it somewhere in, uh, on a website that other people can access it. It's a way then they can collaborate to the project, uh, to the project that they want to. They can see the sort of history of things that have happened. Um, and then you can also see the source code for what people have done in terms of um, their analyses or uh, packages they've been developing and so on and so forth. It's a great learning resource as well. Um, it also uh, uh, provides some very easy tools to keep track of issues and to sort of have conversations about the entire development history of that project. Uh, so these are a couple of links you can um, uh, uh, use to look some stuff up. Uh, I really like this paper at the end. This is a PLOS computational biology paper that came out a couple of years, and it's a basic introduction to everything I've said in a academic paper format. So they have some nice uh, figures with the actual commands you would type in, um, some sort of explanations of things, why things are happening, and also um, they motivate this in terms of making research more open and reproducible, uh, which hopefully we're all on board with. Um, so let me just show you a quick demo of how Git does uh, what it does. Um, so let's say here on my desktop, can everyone see the font sizing okay here? Let me zoom in a little bit. No, you can't see that at all. It's weird. Okay, let's just stick with maybe this size. Okay, so I'm on my desktop here in my terminal. Um, I have one project folder that I've just created. And within this project folder, um, I have two subfolders, maybe one that just has an analysis uh, script in it, one that has some sample data. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this directory and I'm going to put it under version control. That's just telling the time machine I want to start keeping track of things. And I can be very specific about how I do that with these commands. Uh, before I show you exactly what I'll type in, if you go to the mind uh, repository and you uh, go to the tutorials folder and the git github, um, I have, what I've done is I've, I've put the most common commands along with actual little gifs so you can see the general output of how they work and stuff. And hopefully this is a easy way in case you just forget everything that I've said or don't understand anything I've said. Um, and some interactions with um, GitHub and stuff like that too. So feel free to use that as a reference, but you can always bug me with questions and things like that. Um, okay, so right now, uh, the first step that I'd like to, to sort of keep this under version control is using a command called, um, I'm gonna move into this directory and I'm gonna use a command called git init. And it's told me that, hey, I have this empty Git repository here. Um, nothing has sort of happened other than I sort of turned the time machine on. Uh, one of your favorite commands is going to quickly become git status. This is basically going to tell you what's going on. And it's going to basically say, hey, I know that there's these folders here, but I'm not keeping track of anything. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tell the time machine, I'd like to keep track of these folders. I'm going to put them under version control. And this is what the git add command is for. So you can say git add, I want my code folder and my data folder. Okay, and now um, I have my terminal customized a little bit so you can see that it's giving me some information. Um, you can ignore that. But once again, I can just type git status here. And now you, you'll notice that these files were read before are basically saying that, hey, I'm aware of these files. These are things that I know that you want to track. And so this process in Git lingo is called staging something for, for uh, making a snapshot. That's just, you can think of it as just preparing files that you're going to sort of make this snapshot of. of. Um, and so in order to make that snapshot, all we do is run the command git commit. So we type git commit. And this dash m flag with a message here is something that you want to label this snapshot with. It's just telling you, hey, this is what I did. And I might just say this is like the you know, initial commit for a project. And now this is under version control. So this basically means that whatever status, uh, whatever changes, whatever properties of the files that existed right now have been sort of frozen in time for me. And if I ever wanted to roll back to them, I could do that very, very easily. Um, a command that sort of shows you your history of your timeline is called git log. This is really useful. You can sort of see what's going on. And it tells me on this date and this time, um, this is the unique snapshot ID for this commit. And this is the message about it. So you know exactly what happened. 
Now, let's say that I want to like make changes and I want to adapt something here and I want to take another snapshot. So I'm going to work on this. I'm going to go into my say code folder here. Um, I'm going to open up this analysis. Okay, this is a very complicated analysis. I'm going to just change one over here. You know, I might just make a small change here, save this file. Now I could have, I could have created analysis two, which is slightly different analysis one, but we're going to avoid that sort of way of thinking. Instead, I'm going to say I'd like to take another snapshot now uh, so that I can go back between these two versions of the file very easily. And so once again, if I just type git status, git tells me, hey, I noticed that this file I've been tracking has been modified. Do you want to do something about that? Once again, I'm going to say, yep, I'd like you to stage this. If I do uh, git status, you'll see that, OK, I'm ready to take a snapshot of this file. Um, and I can just do the same exact thing I did before. Now, these are not very informative messages, but just for the tutorial purposes here, um, it's a good habit to, to write informative messages. So you remember what you did, and collaborators can sort of help out here. So that, that's a pretty general workflow for just creating snapshots and adding files. Let's say that you want to um, make your code available to other people, whether it's a, a software package or uh, an analysis or something, or just you want to put all of your uh, materials online. So we're going to use GitHub to do that. Um, what we're going to do here is go to github.com. And when you uh, log in and go to your sort of main page, you'll see this big green new button here, which you can't see. Um, and so this allows you to tell GitHub that you want to create a sort of remote cloud option for some repository. And so when I hit this new button here, um, it asks me what I want to do to name this repository. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to name the repository the same thing as whatever your local thing was called here. So my local project is called my project. So I'm just going to create a Git repository called my project. Oh, that already exists. Let's. Um, Let's just call it my project two, and let me just um, rename this. Oops. Okay, so I have I've renamed this here. Uh, it's going to say, "Do you want to give a description to this?" And I might just say, uh, "Demo project." Uh, and it's going to ask me if I want to make this public or private. Uh, this just means that people can search and find your code if they need to, if they want to. Uh, typically, you would have to pay for having this ability. But if people don't know, if you have a EDU email address, Git gives you unlimited free private repositories for it. I think you have to uh, renew it every two years. But uh, it's called the GitHub Student Pack. Uh, they also give you a bunch of other uh, free stuff, too, like some compute hours on, on certain um, uh, public clusters and things like that. Um, so let's just make it a public one. Uh, it's asking me if I want to initialize my repository with a readme file. This is a, a, a practice everyone should get into the habit of doing. I could create a file here on my computer um, called readme, or I can actually have Git one, uh, GitHub create one for me. I'm just going to make one uh, here. and just um, So now I have a readme file in here. Um, I'll want to make sure that Git is tracking it. So right now I've created a file, but it's untracked. So let's create one more snapshot that now includes this readme file. So we're going to add it real quick. We're going to take this snapshot. OK. Uh, and just to show you a quick representation of our timeline so far, here's my log file. right? So a couple minutes ago, I created the commit for this project. Then I changed the analysis file. And now I've added a readme. And now I want to uh, track this on GitHub. So I'm going to click this Create Repository button. And the really nice thing that GitHub does is it gives you the commands when you created a repository for the first time that you want to link your local time machine with this, uh, this cloud version of it. So it's telling you that you want to make sure you initialized and added a readme file. We've done all this stuff, and we've already committed a couple of times. So we're just going to copy this command over. This is basically saying, take my local time machine, and I want to point it to this particular URL on GitHub. So I can just paste this here. And then all I need to do is push it over to uh, GitHub. And hopefully, the internet can support this. Um, but what you'll find is once this process completes, it's just uploading all of your files to GitHub. And if I just refresh this page now, you'll notice that I basically have exactly the folder structure that I want to. Now, anybody can go to this URL and jump right in to any of these folders, and they can um, see exactly what's going on in, uh, in the code there. Um, yeah. 
call code and then another one called data. Yeah. Like it's putting data on GitHub, something you would recommend. Um, so generally speaking, it depends on the data. I think for flat files like TXT and CSV files, it's an okay option. There's much better options for this. Uh, I think maybe, I don't know, Yarek or someone might talk about Datalad at some point. Maybe, we'll find out. But for big data files like nifty images and things like that, um, it's not a really good idea. Git does not track very large binary data sources um, well. There are other options uh, to do that, um, but you know, that'll vary based upon whatever your, your preference is there. But in general, I would say for code and for um, uh, flat files and uh, examples and those kinds of things, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are another one. Um, I think I'll show you guys that, that a little bit later, but um, GitHub can also render Jupyter Notebooks for you, which is really, really nice. So you can sort of get to see a file without having to download a, an actual repository. But, um, so what I'd like to show you now is a sort of second uh, workflow that you might do. So this might work really well for your own personal projects and analyses and things like that. But let's say that you'd like to collaborate on something. You want to contribute to an existing tool, your lab has something, or you want to just uh, uh, um, sort of work on something with other people. So here is a repository that has already been created uh, by our lab for this, uh, for a demo purpose. Um, this is just a similar type of thing. It is an analysis of different cats. Um, we have a code folder and a data folder. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to contribute to this project, okay? So um, again, you can follow along these commands in the, in the tutorial here, um, but what we're gonna do is forking. So forking is this idea of we have the original uh, project with its original timeline, and I'm just gonna create a personal copy in my GitHub account. And the way to do this is to just click this big fork button up here on the right. And GitHub is gonna ask you, where do you wanna place, uh, put this? I'm part of a couple of different organizations, but I'm just gonna make a copy in my personal account. And what this is basically going to do is just clone over everything that has ever been committed into that GitHub repository under your own personal account. So the nice thing about this is I can safely change, break, do anything I want to to this GitHub repository, and the original project is completely unaffected. Uh, so that gives you an opportunity to uh, contribute to things here. And so what you're going to want to do now is you're going to uh, use another command, which is called cloning. So cloning is going to is going to do the sort of opposite of what we did before. We have something that exists only on GitHub, and we'd like to create a local version of it. And so we're going to copy the URL here. Um, you can just copy this to your clipboard. And we're going to use a command called git clone. So I'm going to just move up to my desktop, and I'm going to type this here. So what this is going to do is it's going to download everything that exists on GitHub in this repository, including the history of these files, everything, that entire timeline, and make a local copy. And so now if I look at my desktop, I have this new folder here. And if I move into it, you'll notice that it's exactly the same here. I have a code folder that has some dummy files and a, a sample analysis and a data folder. Um, and uh, I can modify this as I'd like to, right? So let's say that I want to make a modification to one of these files. So I'm going to move into the code folder again, um, just open up this dummy file, and I'll just write something. Oops. Okay. So um, I've changed a file. If I do git status, you'll notice that git has said, hey, I've been already been tracking this file because you've cloned over a git repository. This file has been modified. What would you like to do? Well, I'd like to take a snapshot of this modification. So I'm going to add the file, and then I'm going to commit it. And now I have a snapshot of this local copy. Nothing has changed on GitHub, and nothing has changed about the original project here. Um, once again, I can just quickly look at the log to see what's going on. You'll notice that down here, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the past. And this may be stuff that the original project developers have contributed or other people have collaborated with on the project. But you'll notice that way up here at the top with the timestamp, just like before, we have the commit that I've just made. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to notify the original owners of the code that I've made some change. And maybe they're interested in pulling that into the original project. And so what I'm going to first do is I'm going to push this up to my uh, copy of the code on GitHub. And this is just using the git push command. So if I do this, it's going to push it over to my repository. And give the internet a second here. OK, and you'll notice that this is the URL that it sent it to which is the one that we had cloned for. And I can just refresh this page. And you'll notice that it just puts a little preview of my um, commit message. And if I go into the code folder, you'll see that the file has changed in the way that I've changed it. So now I'd like to tell the original uh, folks here that I've made some changes. Would you like to um, 
uh, incorporate them. And so I can just create a new pull request us either using the button here or the tab over here, which has a big green button on this side. And so this is basically going to tell the original owners. So th these are the sort of, um, it might look a little confusing, but basically on the left side here is where the original code is coming from, the one that we made a personal copy of. So in this case, it's this Cosan Lab uh, repository. And here is my fork, my personal copy of it. And these are the two things I'd like to try to merge if possible. And so I'm gonna tell the uh, original owners here, hey, this is what I've done, um, you know, and create a pull request. So this is gonna send a notification to the original owner of the repository that um, I've made some changes, maybe they wanna incorporate them in here. And GitHub automatically will do a little bit of checking to basically see whether any changes you've made would overwrite things that have happened in the original repository in a way that would potentially break things. And so in this case, it's saying that if you do this, this shouldn't necessarily have any conflicts with any of the original code in the repository. Now, if I go back to the account that's the owner of the repository here, and I look at the code, you'll notice that this pull request um, has a one next to it because I, for my personal account, have just opened up a pull request. And so I can go view this, and it says, oh, okay, someone has updated the analysis. I can look at the commit history here. So in this case, I've just taken one snapshot. I can like very quickly zoom into it and notice that they've added one line and they've changed it to say this. This looks okay to me. I can also review the changes, add comments, do a, a bunch of interactive stuff if I need to. But I can also just merge the pull request. So this is gonna pull in all of the changes they've made into the original repository. And GitHub is gonna ask you, what do you wanna, what sort of information do you wanna to uh, name this merge? So it's the same idea as putting a message with a commit. I'm taking, creating a new snapshot now, which is the fusion of the two repositories. And I'm going to, I'm just gonna leave it as it is, but I can just confirm the merge here. And now if I go back to the uh, original code, you'll notice that GitHub has changed this to merged. And if I go here, the pull request tab has turned in, changed to zero. And if I go to the code now, this is in that original repository, you'll notice that the code that I had added is changed. So this is a sort of typical collaborative workflow and probably the way you might wanna work with people here at Mind. You're gonna, gen the sort of general steps I've outlined. Um, I have a, on the, uh, in the uh, tutorial repository here, here's a couple of PDFs in case you forget this kind of stuff. Um, you know, feel free to refer to these as you as as you know much as you need to. This is a sort of general cheat sheet by um, Atlassian, which I, I always found is pretty useful here. It just gives you a bunch of the commands and sort of what they do. Um, this quick reference is uh, made by me. It's just describing uh, basically the two workflows that I've shown you. So how would you contribute to an existing project on GitHub, and how you would create your own. Uh, from scratch, and then another really quick reference for um, how to use these commands in case you, you ever forget that stuff. Um, that's pretty much what I was gonna talk about. Um, maybe I went a little quick, but if you guys have questions and stuff, I'm happy to try to answer. Yeah. Yeah, so cloning is taking basically what you have on GitHub, a repository, and just downloading a local copy of it. Forking is specific to taking a project that exists on GitHub and then making a copy onto GitHub itself, so not downloading it locally, um, that you can modify maybe under your own account or some other account, basically. Yeah. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, I would say it's conditional on how much you trust the people that are pushing over to that. You know, if you think people, like especially people who um, maybe are unfamiliar with it, there's always a potential of breaking something and things. But if there's multiple co-managers on a project, um, usually if there's one or two, I think it's okay if people are, are just pushing directly to the original thing. You'll find it'll get really hairy really fast. So forking is, a, is usually a better option. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty typical. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. So if they were going to use something locally, then they would uh, pull in the changes. So rather, you don't have to. Um, I didn't mention this, but the the command is uh, here uh, as an example. Once you have a uh, once you want to sort of synchronize what's going on locally, what's on GitHub, you're going to use the push and pull commands. So what, if you already have an existing copy of something on GitHub, you can just pull in and that's going to attempt to pull in the latest changes. So the, in this case, the original owner would just git pull the changes that they've just merged into their, into their original project. Yep. 
that's one possibility. Another possibility is that they just branch, so they create an alternate timeline, and then they merge in your changes. They pull in your changes to, just to that experimental timeline that doesn't affect the core project itself. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't actually lock it. So if someone's working on a change, it doesn't lock it. So no one else can work on it. That's the best to solve that problem. Is why you have to keep forking things. And then sometimes um, you might have forked the main repository and then push the changes, but then someone else has merged another change. So did you talk about how to keep your fork up to date? Uh, no, I didn't put an example of that, but I have a snippet of that somewhere. I can toss that in the Slack. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, that's a pretty a pretty common use case. So you're working on your own independent fork. The original project owner makes some changes. So now you're sort of desynchronized with them, right? So maybe before you ask to pull your changes into the original repository, you want to grab all the latest versions of what they've added. And so you're going to sort of fast forward your fork over to what they've done. Um, I can add a snippet to that um, later on. I don't have an example right now. Sometimes the command line communication is Yeah, so there's two that are very popular, I think. One is this program called Git Kraken, which you can download here. And this is really nice because it totally visually represents everything. It's a sort of standalone project to, um, to do this. Uh, I haven't used this myself. Um, what I use instead is um, a lot of uh, code editors now, like VS Code and Atom and even Sublime Text, if people are familiar with those, have their own visual representations um, and sort of plugins for managing these kinds of things. So if I um, if I open up Atom, for example, this is what it looks like. Um, I know it's a little. If you can see that. No, maybe zoom in here. But um, uh, so this, it's, I know it's really hard to see. Uh, it's easier to zoom into the font size here. But what, what this will do is when I'm working on a project and if I decide to make some sort of changes to this file here, um, let's say I just edit this file. I can save this and you'll notice now Git has told me, hey, there's something that's changed in this sort of unstaged section up here. Uh, maybe you want to commit it. Maybe you want to take a snapshot of it. You want to do something. I can um, do that. Uh, Oh, I call it dummy file. Right, and now that's moved from this sort of unstaged area to this stage area, and I take a snapshot of it. So th this is uh, Adam's representation of this. I think Git Krakens is probably a little more user friendly and has uh, some nice visuals and stuff, but um, nothing wrong with the command line. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a pretty popular use case, actually. Um, you know, oftentimes, like, let's say you're working on something for some sort of project and you're going to publish a paper at a later date, but you're still working things out. You might actually have that under version control and synced with GitHub. So maybe internally to your lab or space, you're, you're working on it. And when you release the paper, you make the GitHub repository public, and then other people can see that, including the history of the development of the project, which might be useful for people when they're learning and stuff.
GitHub, you almost need GitHub as a kind of modern lab notebook. So uh, we all the time, so like Matt uh, described, like make a figure and then we'll break something and then it's like mysterious how that figure came about. So that's a great thing to revert back. I've also found that um, using Git and GitHub in, in the sort of private sense you were talking about for uh, syncing like experiment presentation scripts across multiple machines is really useful. So in our lab, we do a lot of like interactive things. We have, let's say, lab laptops that I'm going to just use solely for the purpose of present, presenting uh, presentation scripts, but I might develop them personally. There's a bug I discover one day, and then I want to quickly, I'm running a subject in five minutes, and I need to make sure everything's up to date on five different computers, that's a really nice use case for a sort of private GitHub repository situation. So. <laughs> yeah. Particularly for like, if, you, if you're like me and you like to like configure things a lot, people like to put their configuration files in GitHub, so if their computer breaks, they can just clone down everything and like everything's back to the way it used to be, so. Oh yeah, uh, GitHub offers yeah. Um, GitHub offers free hosting for so every user on GitHub gets a w like a website account if your website is generated using static files instead of like a complicated content management system. And so that's uh, I think every branch if you create a new branch on GitHub called gh-pages, you'll automatically get a website that's like the name of your repository. So in this case, it would be mine2018.github.io. That's a free thing that they offer, and so you, you get web hosting and stuff for free. And then you can use the Git GitHub workflow to like just p change your website whenever you want to and things like that. So. Yep. Uh, yeah. So this is the source code for the um, GitHub Mind page for the what's the Mind Summer Mind doc? What is it? No, I'm not going to clone it. What's the what's the URL of our? Whatever that was on the summer, 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 summer. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, it's really hard to see. The internet's terrible in here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you can always buy. So this is really nice too because you can buy like a domain name for a lot cheaper than like a place to host it usually. So if you wanted to buy like you know, summermind.com, that might cost you like 10 bucks for three years, but buying a hosting location where you store the files is more expensive. So you can easily change the URL to something by just adding a single file to your GitHub repository, but the actual storage of the website files just lives on GitHub. This is how Git is like traveling back and forth. <laughs> 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 Which is really the creative thing about it. <laughs> Yes.
Um, so this is an example of that. This is not loading, but you'll notice these little badges will come up in a second. So um, this idea of webhooks is something that's really amazing about GitHub. So basically, you can set it up such that uh, anytime you push something up to GitHub, some other magical thing happens on some other website. And so one of these is this continuous integration thing. So you might develop some tool, you put the code up on GitHub, and now you want some tests to run. So every time you change something, uh, those tests run automatically. And this, co this concept is called continuous integration. And so you can easily configure, there's all these sort of settings for specific GitHub repositories up here. You can easily um, change those such that um, things happen when you, when you push. You know, so you can create, automatically create documentation for websites. You can automatically run tests. Um, the way that our container works for uh, um, that we're providing to you here is I'll make changes, push them up to GitHub, and the container gets built automatically on Docker's website, for example, and you guys can just pull the changes and stuff. So that's another sort of advantage of using of using that. Awesome. Thanks.